Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for coming in. We appreciate it. Um, it strikes me, um, I know you like history. Is that your major? Was that one of your majors? Did you study that? Yep. Yeah. And, um, and I think history is always instructive. One of the things that's most interesting about history is if you look back at these pivot moments in human history, the people that lived through them didn't realize that's what was happening. When you're living a hinge moment in history, you know, you're busy with everyday life and everything else that's going on, and sometimes you don't entirely perceive it. So I, I'm pleased, uh, as I read the beginning of, of your statement here, and I heard it as I, before I came in on the broadcast, um, you wrote, we meet at an inflection point. The post-Cold War world is over, and there's an intense competition underway to determine what comes next. So it's an acknowledgement that this is not what it was like 10 years ago, five yeah. years ago, very different. Um, and that's important. I, I would argue that we're beyond simply uh, a competitive, and I understand why we talk about strategic competition. And I don't say this with any joy in my heart, but simply because it's sort of par for the course in human history. I, I think we're entering perhaps the beginning of a period of, of conflict, which doesn't necessarily always mean military conflict, but conflict nonetheless. We have an all-out war in Europe. Um, that, that's most clearly a conflict, and it's been a globalized one. People call it a proxy war, but it's been globalized. Uh, we saw that very clearly yesterday with Xi's visit to, to, uh, to Moscow, but beyond that, sort of the way the world is aligned in different ways. Um, we have seen the rise of, by necessity, militarization. Germany, Japan, mm -hmm. nothing that we're against, frankly, because given the necessities of the world, but this post-Cold War, post-World War II order in which both countries decided that they were going to be less martial, less military, necessity has changed it for both of them. Uh, a positive development for our alliance, but nonetheless a reality. We have these nine Eastern European uh, countries that are even more hawkish than the rest of Europe. Uh, geography mm -hmm. puts them right at the edge of Russia's aggression when they can see very clearly what's happening. We have the very clear outlines of this emerging conflict. Uh, the US, the West, the democracies in an alliance, um, the China, Russia, alliance, they don't want to call it that, but that's what it is, in, in conjunction with others like Iran potentially participating as well. And then these dozens and dozens of developing so-called non-aligned nations all trying to cut deals for themselves. We saw that with Saudi Arabia, you see it throughout Africa, et cetera. And, and then on top of that, in this, in this emerging block of two nations, uh, uh, between, it's, it's not simply these military alliances, we're seeing the rise of alternatives to the SWIFT banking system, to the US dollar, ways to, uh, the growth of countries that now have a vested interest in figuring out how to evade sanctions. Um, you see uh, supply chain diversity. Europe is diversifying where it gets its energy and the rest of the world is diversifying mm -hmm. because I think there's the understanding that th the market is responding to the fact that we're entering a period of conflict. It is in that vein, given all of that, that I'm really concerned about whether we can continue to afford to do some of the things that we're doing. I don't mean from a dollar standpoint, but from a geopolitical standpoint. So for example, last summer, the State Department released a report attacking the Solomon Islands for their stance on same-sex marriage. It alienated their partners there. The next week, they signed a mutual security agreement with Beijing and the Pacific. And the prime minister uh, declined to participate uh, in the commemoration of the memorial marking the Battle of Guadalcanal. That's just one example. Um, I mean, we could go, I could take 10, 15 minutes to go through each of these here and, 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 and point to different such places where we've sort of aligned ourselves in that way. How can, isn't, haven't we now reached a point where, frankly, we have to understand we are entering a period of geopolitical competition bordering on conflict, diplomatic conflict, economic conflict, and God forbid, but potentially military conflict, and as a result, need to govern ourselves accordingly. Not that these values or whatever our values may be don't matter, but our approach has to look very different than it did 5, 10, 15 years ago when, frankly, the U.S. was the world's sole superpower, and we had in many cases, the luxury uh, to be able to go through and do some of these things. Because it's not that these issues don't matter, it's that none of these issues are going to matter. If 15, 10, or five years from now, we live in a world in which the dominant economic, military, and technological power of, in the world is in the hands of authoritarian regimes um, who frankly resemble what the vast majority of human history looks like, and that is led by despots, where there are no individual rights, 
and um, all these things that have made not just our prosperity and freedom possible here, but the world a better place. Isn't it time for us to view the world through the lens, frankly, of the, out, the beginnings, the early stages of a geopolitical conflict? Senator, I share your, I share your basic analysis. And um, I think that, uh, in a sense, that's exactly uh, what we're doing. Um, we have worked from day one to do two things, foundational things. Uh, one is to support important investments in ourselves, which I, I, I talked about a little earlier, to make sure that we're as strong and competitive as we can be. And I think, thanks to Congress, we've made those historic inv investments. And the, the Chips and Science Act is maybe the, uh, the best example. But second, uh, we have worked from day one both to re-engage, rejuvenate, and strengthen our existing alliances and partnerships, but also build new ones, new coalitions of countries, and even beyond countries, that are fit for purpose in dealing with different parts of the challenge that I think you described very, very well. Just to give you one quick example, um, when we're dealing with uh, the challenge posed to supply chains uh, around the world to make sure that we have and benefit from diversified and resilient uh, supply chains, we brought together countries in a coalition uh, to do that, uh, to, uh, in many cases, near shore and French shore, to have early warning systems in place if they're being disrupted, and also through something called the Mineral Securities Partnership, make sure that the United States and like-minded countries are focused on ensuring that uh, we're able to invest in effectively uh, some of the critical minerals that are so important to so much of what we're doing. Um, when it comes to uh, our engagement in the um, uh, Asia-Pacific region, the Indo-Pacific, we have um, put that on uh, full throttle. We've reopened uh, uh, an embassy, as you know, in the Solomon Islands. We're looking at other places in the Pacific Islands where we can make sure that we're present in ways that we haven't been in recent years, precisely because we are engaged in a competition. Um, and I could go uh, down the list of different um, collections of fit-for-purpose partnerships that we built to deal with exactly the world that, that you're describing. I do think, and you said it, that um, as we do that, uh, the values that unite us are also hugely important to the strength and solidarity of uh, these alliances and partnerships. Now, not every country that we need to be working with is in the same place uh, that we are. I think we, we, we recognize that. And we need to make sure that we're um, adjusting and flexible uh, enough for that. The last thing is this. There are a number of countries that are looking, as you know, very carefully at what's happening, making their own decisions, in some sense making their own bets about which direction they're going to go in. And from my perspective, this is less about saying to them, you have to choose, and more offering them a, a choice. If we're able to do that, for example, uh, in being able to catalyze uh, real uh, infrastructure investment that's a race to the top, not a race to the bottom, they're gonna choose us. Um, we also have to have some strategic patience. There are countries that have had long-standing, for decades, relationships, for example, with Russia, where moving away from that as they want to do, is not like flipping a light switch. It is moving an aircraft carrier. We have to work with them uh, to do that. But I, I, I share the basic um, uh, uh, picture that you've painted and really welcome working with you to figure out the most effective ways to deal with it. Thank you.